people must get a laptop for this class. Definitely. Well, mobile phones, naturally, they are very small. They're small, naturally. So let's, let's look for laptops, please. Right. So, um, so the part one, like I said, will be a couple of lectures, maybe between four to six, seven. I don't know, depending on how we are able to gain time. And it will be on cost and management accounting, new developments. Okay. So the first one we'll be looking at will be absorption costing and the marginal costing. We'll be looking at them briefly because I know uh, you have looked at these topics in MA1 and MA2. So we're going to look at them briefly. Um, our emphasis, of course, will be on absorption costing more under ABC. Okay, ABC, as we know, is activity-based costing. Okay, um, ABC is... Uh, it's a fairly new concept. I'm sure you know about it. It's a fairly new concept of costing, you know, compared to absorption costing and marginal costing. So usually uh, we call absorption costing, marginal costing as traditional costing techniques. Okay. Whilst ABC target costing, life cycle costing, we call them modern costing techniques. Okay. They have been in existence actually for a long time. But to be honest with you, it's the absorption costing and marginal costing that existed long, long before them. Okay? So we'll come to see um, ABC, for example, um, activity-based costing. Activity-based costing is just a subset of absorption costing. You know, um, subset for the fact that in absorption costing, we usually have one OAR or one FOAR. That's the fixed overhead absorption rate. The difference between marginal costing, absorption costing, ABC, you know, and so on and so forth, is only one difference, and that difference is how overheads are absorbed. For prime cost, we don't have any issues. Every costing technique treats it the same way. Because prime cost, you know, meaning direct cost, direct material, direct labor, direct exp expenses are always treated the same way in every costing technique. Okay? Because the simple reason is all direct costs are called direct because they are directly attributable to products, departments, or services they relate to. So you can be able to trace them directly. The problem we have is how do we treat overheads? So the way we treat overheads was the reason why we have different costing techniques. So in other words, the way overheads are treated in absorption costing, in marginal costing, in ABC, and so on and so forth, are done differently. But that of direct costs, the treatments are always the same because we don't have any issues with them. We can be able to trace them directly to the products or services or the department or the cost center. I hope this is clear. Are you with me? Yes. Are you with yes, me? Yes. Yes, we are with you. Okay. So we're going to see how you know, each of these costing techniques are treated in real life. So we're looking at ADB, activity-based budgeting. We look at uh, target costing, okay? Uh, activity-based budgeting is uh, a budgeting technique which is done from ABC. So for example, after the costing, um, after using your ABC costing, you can be able to use your activity-based costing based on um, your activity base. So you can use your ABB activity based budgeting based on your activity base costing, okay? So target costing is, um, like I said, is a new costing technique, just like the ABC. Um, it is very, very, very important when it comes to pricing. Okay? Very, very important when it comes to pricing because we know in absorption costing, we consider the direct costs 
we consider overheads and then try to use the total cost as one of the barometers to measure our selling price, okay? But the only problem with this, um, this uh, pricing technique, the pricing technique using absorption costing is, it does not take cognizance of what prevails in the market. For example, if you are, let's say, into a newspaper business, okay, and uh, someone, um, let's say, not only newspaper, but let's say you are into printing business, okay, and uh, a client comes, a customer comes and places an order to print, let's say, 1,000, you know, uh, 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 how to call it, 1,000 books, you know. So, if you have to print those 1,000 books, you have to determine your selling price. How do you determine your selling price? You could determine your selling price by using absorption costing. How do you do that? You consider all your direct costs. Okay, someone wants to say something? Sorry? Hello? Yasin? Yasin, can you mute your mic, please? Okay, fine. Good. Sirif, you need to mute your mic as well. Sirif Ba, mute your mic. Okay, are you following? Are you getting me right? Hello? Yes. yes. Okay, excellent. So I'm trying to explain target costing, okay? Um, well, what I was saying is that if a customer places an order, you know, to a printing company, let's say customer who wants to print some books, if you want to give the price you're going to charge for each book, if you have to print it, you have to consider a lot of factors. You have to consider the paper that you're going to use to print those books. You have to consider the ink. You have to consider the materials you will need for printing, like plates. You know, in printing, usually you, you need a plate that the ink will be on, you know, so that you can run it on the, on the machine. So you consider all the direct costs, okay? You consider the overheads that you're going to use. Um, the overheads will include the, the rent, the electricity, you know, and so on and so forth. So after doing a costing with all the direct costs and with all the, um, with, with all the overheads, then you will determine the unit cost, okay? And then that unit cost, you will add a margin on top of it, okay? You will, uh, sorry, you will add a markup on, to, on top of it, okay? You will add a profit markup on top of it, let's say 10% or 25%, depending on the costing regime of the organization. Then after adding that, let's say after doing all your calculation, you came to realize that the uh, unit cost is $100. And then you want 10% profit markup. So you add 10% 10, 10 of 100. So that will be $10. So you'll have what? 110. Now you say, okay, I'm going to print the book for you for 110 each. Is there any problem with that price class? Is there any problem with that price? No, there is no problem with it. Are you sure there's no problem with that price? Do you agree? Do you agree to him saying there's no problem with that price? Do you all agree that there's no problem with that price? Hello, are you with me? Are you with me? What of the indirect costs? No, all the indirect costs have been put into consideration. The indirect costs are the overheads, isn't it? So we put all, yeah, all of them yeah. into consideration and we determine our unit price. The problem we have with that selling price is, is it the same selling price range that is tenable in the market? 
If you go to other printing companies, are they printing their books for that cost? Will you be able to know that? Will you be able to know that from that costing? You won't. So it's only target costing that can allow you to know what prices are attainable in the market. So that's why when we are doing target costing, our starting point is usually a market research. So you do a market research and know what price range those similar products. For example, you do a market research and say, for example, if you're going to print, uh, let's say, a novel, you'll do a market price to see how much other printing companies are printing, you know, each unit of novel. You know, you okay, you want to charge $110. It's possible. Let's say this is, um, uh, uh, let's say, Daily Observer. You know, Daily Observer, they do some commercial printing as well. Let's say you go to Gambia, Gambia Printing, yeah, Gambia uh, Book Production or whatever you call it. You go there, that same novel with, with the same number of pages range, maybe those people are, you know, printing it for $70 each. Are you going to be competitive? Is your business no, no, you're competitive? No, you're not. Competitive. It won't be competitive. It won't be competitive. You are charging 110 Others are charging $70. They will go to the one with $70. So the target costing approach is a very, very, very good costing technique whereby you consider what is tenable in the market. That's where you start. Okay, we'll come to, we'll come to look at it. Okay, then we have life cycle costing. Life cycle costing is a, is a costing technique that looks at products and services and it tries to determine its um, lifetime revenue versus its lifetime cost, okay? All the costing techniques that I've mentioned before, ABC, target costing, they are all periodic cost. They, they, they only relate to a period. For example, if you want to find a cost for a year, for a week, and so on and so forth. So usually this, but for the life cycle costing, looks at the product or the services from its inception to when the product phases away, okay? All the revenue that the product is able to generate and all the costs. Then you'll be able to know whether this particular product line or service line is profitable or not. Is that clear? Are you with me? Yes, we are with you, sir. Yes, I want, yes, sir. To, I want to make sure I carry you along so that I don't just talk, 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 and nobody's getting me right, okay? So please, um, I'm sure this is just introduction of the syllabus, but uh, you can stop me at any point in time if you want to ask anything, right? Okay, so next we're going to look at um, um, environmental costing or EMA, environmental management accounting. Very interesting. I'm sure you like it. I think usually it's the it's the topic that students will like most. Uh, we'll have some documentary videos about the Gambia, how we are able to, you know, um, destroy our environment, and how some people are trying to 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 save their environment, you know, and stuff. And we're going to look at how you know, uh, conventionally, um, environmental management accounting is gaining momentum, okay? Because um, um, it's becoming uh, mandatory for bigger institutions, for bigger organizations to make a disclosure in their financial statements as to the way they interacted with their environment during the period of reporting. Is that clear? So, environmental accounting is becoming very, very important. So we'll see. We'll look at value engineering. Uh, value engineering is, um, is about, um, uh, how to call it, um, how do we um, um, change our production lines? How do we ensure we produce efficiently how do we ensure we remove procedures and processes that are 
you know, not cost effective in our production process. So in other words, value engineering is, uh, is, is a situation whereby, you know, uh, management tries to cut down on costs that won't add any value to the product or the service. Okay, we're going to look at this. It's also very, very interesting. So the use of ICT, of course, will be throughout the, uh, because we will be doing uh, all the questions using spare seats. Okay, so that's part one for you. Any questions on part one? We're going to move to part two. We're going to move to part two, yeah? Okay, any questions, please? Any observations? Hello? Okay, I think it's me. We are with you, sir. Okay. Yes, we are with you. Good. So, part two, we will be doing with accounting for short term decision making accounting for short-term decision making and we'll have a couple of lectures maybe three four five depending on the speed so under this part we'll be looking at decision making but on short-term basis what is short-term what's the definition of short-term in accounting if you talk about short-term in accounting what do you mean Activities within the financial financial year. Okay, these are periods that are within one financial year. So it may be days, it may be weeks, it may be months, it may be quarterly, but it must not go beyond one year. If it exceeds one year, it's called what long term in accounts. But please take note of this. If you hear short term, it's always within one year, maximum 12 months. Is that clear? So these are decision making that, you know, don't depend on data that is long term. So the first one we look at will be contribution analysis. We know what contributions are. Contribution is, of course, the difference between the selling price and the older prime costs. So usually, the contribution is used in a lot of short-term decision making. If you want to make a selection of products that you need to produce, you immediately calculate their contribution. The one with a higher contribution uh, may be considered first. Okay, so the reason why contribution analysis is useful in short-term decision making is because contribution is a clean profit. You know, contribution is equivalent to profit, but it is profit that does not consider fixed costs, okay? So it is profit before all fixed costs, okay? You know, fixed costs, of course, um, may not be clean. You know, clean in the sense that, um, they may not relate directly to the product or service. You know, for example, if you say, if you want to take a decision as to which product to produce, you know, naturally you will look at the direct cost of those products, you look at the, the, the direct sales of those products and you knock it off and then you have your contribution. But your fixed cost, okay, your fixed cost does not have a direct bearing on your product. So, in other words, fixed costs are everybody's business. So, that's why we use these techniques, try to share the fixed costs between products or services. Okay? So, contribution is very, very, very important when it comes to short-term decision-making. Is that clear? Okay. So, next we're going to look at make or buy decisions. Should we make a product or should we outsource it from an outside supply okay should we make it us meaning should we produce it in-house should we print the books or should we go and get someone else an outsourcer to print the books 
We buy from him and then we supply it to our customer. So make or buy decision, very, very important. It's also short term. So what you consider, of course, is always the marginal revenue versus the marginal cost. Okay, then we look at the shutdown decision. Should we shut down um, a whole operation? Should we shut down a branch? Should we shut down a product line? Should we shut down a service line? Or should we continue with it? Okay, so what you look at is the effects of shutting down of that particular branch or department or product line on the overall organization. If I shut down a particular product line and uh, as a result of shutdown, there was negative effects on the profits of the organization, then I must not do that. Okay, so that's the short term. So we will look at them in details. Limiting factor decision, very, very important, very, very um, useful. What are limiting factors? I'm sure you must have come, come across this terminology before, isn't it? What are limiting factors? Plain English, yeah? Limiting factors. Yasin? Have you ever heard of the terminology yeah, limiting, limiting factor? Yes, Mr. Fadi. Um, uh, <laughs> Mr. Fadi, I had. Is that Yasin or someone else? The voice is my own? Um, Mr. Fadi, what were you saying? Uh, it's me, it's Mohammed. Or is two of you uh, sharing the same, yeah? Is it? No. Oh, okay. Right, okay. That was a class. Right, fine. No, no, I was saying, um, have you ever come across the terminology limiting factor? Yasin? Mohammed Gay. Gay. Hello, sir. Miss, hello? Yes, Yasin. You said if I had a word, limiting factor. Yes. Have you? You have not. Okay, fine. We move. Uh, Mr. Class Rep, Karamo? Yes. Limited Honorable Karamo Sane? Yes. Limiting factor, we can say. You want the Honorable title, yeah? No, no, I'll drop that one. I don't want <laughs> yes, Karamo? Yes, limiting factors. I want the class to be interactive as possible. Please, all my classes, I don't, I don't like a boring class, you know. I want all of you to participate. Um, limit, limiting factors, they are variable that causes change. They are variable that causes change? Yes. Yeah. Ah, okay. You agree? You, do you agree with Yasin, class? Do you, ask, do you agree with her? There are variables that... Yeah, changes in output. Changes in output. Yeah. Do you agree? Karamo, you agree? Yes, but in the sense we can say limiting factors are, fact, are these are the limitations to factors that are directly affect the cost of production. Yeah, simple. Limited, limited. Something that is limiting you. Something that is preventing you from achieving what you, what you want to achieve. So, simply, limiting factors are factors of production that makes us unable to achieve our target production and sales quantity. So if there are factors, you know, we all know, of course, production factors, um, land, label, capital, and so on and so forth. So you cannot have any production without those factors. So if any of them is lacking, you call it what? It is limited in nature. So limited factor decision is about how do you manage scarce resource in production to maximize profitability. Simple. So as accountants, we need to give that advice. You know, we all know, of course, 
um, economics will tell you that, you know, ends are many, there are plenty, but then, you know, uh, 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 how do we meet those ends? The factors that we use are, of course, always limited, okay? So if you have a situation whereby uh, you wanted to produce, but you didn't have the quality of labor hours to ensure that that production takes place, what do you do to ensure that whatever labor hours is available is maximized to the best so that that production will bring the best possible profitability for the organization. Okay? So that's about limiting factor decision. What do you do when you have shortage in the stuff that you need to produce? Okay? As accountants, we should give that advice. Okay, the next topic we will look at is for the processing decision. Um, for the processing decision is about do you do you sell um, a work in progress product or do you process it further? Do you add value to it and you know sell it at that level? This is very very typical in an African situation. Um, in the Gambia, for example, we produce our groundnuts. Okay. Farmers grow groundnuts everywhere in the country. In fact, I understand the, the, the trade season was on. I don't know whether it's ended now, okay? But what do farmers get from their harvest? If they produce peanuts, and they sell their peanuts, they get what? Peanuts. Do you know what I mean? They will produce their peanuts, sell their peanuts, and get peanuts. Do you agree to this? Yeah, because what they get is not enough. It's nothing. They don't get anything. Yeah. So if we have ability to further process those peanuts. How do we further process them? So many options. We can further process them and get what? Oil, cooking oil, edible oil. For your information, peanut oil and sesame oil are the best quality oil because they are very rich in vitamin E. And vitamin E is an anti-aging agent. Very rich. But what do we do with our peanuts? We sell it to these people and they take it to all over the place, they further process it and they get millions out of them. Is that not the case? Yes. That's the, yes, case. Exactly. That's the case. So this is one of the reasons why Africa is lacking seriously behind. All the raw materials that the West, all the stuff, all the things that the West is benefiting over there comes from Africa. Maybe peanut is a small one, but go to Ivory Coast, for example. Ivory Coast, they are the largest producers of what? Cocoa beans. Do you know the benefits of cocoa beans in the West? They use cocoa beans for what? Do you know? Yeah. For what? Coffee, chocolate. A lot of for things. good, for chocolate, for coffee, you know, for oval team, just name them. Ivory Coast is the largest supplier of cocoa beans. If you follow the media that much, you will see to it that there was one documentary, a CNN documentary. Uh, there was a lady who went to Ivory Coast to these um, cocoa yam plantations. And in some cases, they use child labor, unfortunately. Right? So uh, she went and met these farmers, the way they toil to get those cocoa beans, the way they toil, and they are very, very, very poor. And you look at those cocoa beans, the, the, the farmers or, or, or the, 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 the dealers who buy those cocoa beans from them and take them to the West and further process them, you look at their disparity, those ones are millionaires. 
So the guy went there, you know, in the field in, in, in the, where, where they produce this cocoa, yeah? you know, he, he went with some samples of, you know, what they produce, what comes out of those cocoa, yams, like chocolate bars, coffee, and so on and so forth. You know, <laughs> he, you know, uh, gave a chocolate bar to, to, to them, and they looked at it, they, they ate it. You know, I don't know whether you've ever tried a chocolate bar. So sweet. So when they ate chocolate bar, they were very, very happy and couldn't believe that this could come from, you know, the, the, the nuts they are producing at that, at, 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 in, in those bushes. So he asked them, he said, do you know, do you know about it? He said, no, we have never heard of this. We have never seen it. We have never eaten it. And the guy told them that this is from these cocoa beans you are working on. Can you imagine that? And those dealers who, you know, uh, buys those stuff from, from, from farmers in agriculture and so on and so forth, you know, they, they, they sell it to, to these big institutions like mass, you know, uh, sneakers, you know, all those big, big companies who produce chocolate, all these big companies who produce, um, you know, coffee and so on and so forth, they, 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 they get millions from that. So to be honest with you, we need to think ahead. Our, our university education should not only lead us to become employees, but we have to think ahead. We have to think outside the box and say, what can I do with my knowledge? What can I do to ensure that I create employment for lots of other people who are unfortunate? What can I do to make the best use of the raw materials we have. Africa is rich in everything. But what do we get in return? Nothing. Okay? So this further processing decision making is also very, 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 very important. Okay? We're going to look at it. Is that clear, everyone? Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Don't worry, we'll soon close. Um, I'm sure there will be people who will have class after five, is it? Is that the case? Is that the case? Yes. Okay. So we'll try to stop at about, well, yeah, it's almost five o'clock, maybe in the next five minutes or so. Okay? So don't you ponder over this. It's unfortunate. You know, our granules, where do they go? Sometimes they'll make oil from them and then they bring it to us and sell it to us at very, very expensive prices. Don't you think so? In fact, when they sell it back, we cannot buy it. We can't. We can't. That's true. What about our timber? Unfortunately, Nesa, we are going through a lot of colonization. The white people have colonized us. Now, do you know who are colonizing us? The Chinese. We are selling all our good wood, all our good locks to them. For peanuts. For peanuts. That's why I go around the country, go around the country, almost all the, I mean, uh, the vegetation is gone. The vegetation is gone. People are, you know, felling these big trees, the mahogany trees, and name them. The jalo tree, the, the cane, all of them are going. They fell them and then they sell it to, you know, these people for what? For nothing. And they will take it to their country, you know, make millions out of them process furniture from them and they'll, they'll bring it to us here and we sell it for hundreds and you know thousands and thousands of dollars yeah. they won't even give us first class they will give us the second classes and the third classes exactly. because we cannot afford the first class no you can't the first classes go to the americas and the and the, and the europe and, and and so on this is true this is true so to be honest um you know i'm sure you'll enjoy the the, the m3 there are a lot of you know real life things some are so you know heartbreaking some are so touching and stuff like that i mean yeah so definitely it's high time we 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 we, we woke up as africans and do something for ourselves okay so we're going to look at um uh, cvp that's cost volume profit analysis or commonly called break-even analysis very very useful very important that uh, we make use of. So every topic that we're going to do is so relevant for your life. Break-even analysis is, uh, is a very, very useful tool that is used in business planning. And you know, it's only here that you can just 
wake up one day and come up with a business without any proper business planning. But in the West, you cannot, you cannot go ahead with any business or no serious financial institution will fund any business without a proper business plan. And one of the most important tools that you can use in the preparation of business plan is what? Break-even analysis. I hope we know what break-even analysis is. Break-even, of course, is the point where total sales revenue equals total cost. So break-even point is the quantity of product that we have to produce and sell in order to be at equilibrium, in order for cost it's and, 17 hours. in order for costs and in order for revenue and cost to be equal. So if you know this number of products, this number of units, before you go ahead with any business, is that not gonna be useful information for you? Because one, you will know if I want to be profitable. I need to produce this number of units, period. If I produce the break-even quantity, I can only be, I can only break even. So the only time I can make profit is when I produce beyond pro, break beyond break-even quantity. Is that not the case? Yes. Yeah, oh yes. Is it not useful? Very useful. So please, um, one thing I will not do is I don't allow my students to memorize concepts and pour them on exam papers. No. Every topic that we deal with here is very, very, very relevant to your life as an individual, very relevant to your working life, and very, very relevant to other people's working life that we could easily make money from. Some of these topics, there are some accountants who are specializing on implement. There are some accountants who are doing consulting only on break even. There are some accountants who are specialized in delivering ABC, in ensuring that organizations take up their costing technique from conventional costing technique to ABC. Okay, so all these are really important. There are people who specialize in short-term decision making. They advise organization when do they have to shut down, when do they have to make or buy things, you know, limiting factor decisions. There are some institutions, some accountancy, you know, uh, consultants who have specialized in this topic. So all of them are really, really relevant. So we must understand their concept and try to apply them in real life. And we can easily make money from them. I don't know whether you know, there are people who produce business plans for people here and they can make money out of it. Okay, so business plan, what goes into it? The most important thing that goes into it, of course, you must put some financial budget in there. Budgeting of revenue and budgeting of cost. You must do your break even analysis. You must do this, you must do that. So all that can easily be done by accountant. Even if you are not employed, you can make money out of it, isn't it? You know, when we start this, you know, obviously we will we will discuss more on them. But you know, you could go to you know uh, institutions, these small businesses, and prepare some of these statements for them. Start free for some time. You know, talk to them. Say, I will do this for you free. Do it for one or two, three people. They will talk to other people, and then you know there will come a time when you know you will have more and more clients who will be ready to pay more. But as Gambians, we are not innovative. Um, the only time we are happy is when we, when we go to university or whatever, we are employed by someone. Fine, it's good to be employed, but then, you know, in case you're not, it's good to be innovative. You can do things on your own that can earn you money, isn't it? Okay? So, uh, uh, the last but not the least topic we're going to do on uh, uh, part two will be relevant cost analysis we will include opportunity cost, avoidable cost, variable cost, incremental cost, and so on and so forth. Okay, for the sake of time, I think we need to rush uh, the last part. So the last, of course, uh, the last topic on uh, uh, part two will be accepting or rejecting orders. Should we accept an order that has been placed by a customer or should we reject it? 
because if the order is not profitable, why do you go for it? In business, why we go? Why we go in business? Because we want to make profit. So if there is an order that is not profitable, okay, in this case, the profitability will be the contribution. If the contribution is a negative contribution, you can go ahead with it. Okay? So we'll look at it. You have to look at some factors before you can accept or reject order. So the last but not the least part is um, investment appraisal. It's commonly called investment appraisal or accounting for long-term decisions. And as we all agree, long-term decisions are decisions that relate to periods that are more than one year. Okay, periods that are more than one year. Okay, and some of the topics we will be looking at under this will be, um, because we'll look at the investment appraisal decision technique, what are some of the procedures that we need to follow, and then we will look at the methods that we need to use in order to, um, in order to appraise long-term projects, in order to appraise investments that are of long term that are in long term nature okay so one of the first method will be the payback period the payback period is the period it takes for an investment to recover its initial capital outlay the second one we're going to look at is the arr which is very similar to our rose our return on capital employee formula so the account rate of return then we will look at the famous NPV, which is uh, by far the most important topic and by far the most robust topic in investment appraisals. Okay, uh, in NPV, what we look at, we only look at cash flow. We discount all the cash inflows and we discount all the cash outflows and find the difference between them. That's what we call our net present values. So this does not consider notional costs like depreciation, you know, costs that does not give rise to cash flow. So this does not consider those. It only considers costs and revenue that are cash, cash in nature. Okay. And then the last, of course, but not the least topic. In part three, of course, which will be the last but not the least topic of our MA3 will be the internal rate of return, the IRR, which has got a similar, you know, uh, similar way of uh, solving with uh, NPV. Okay, we'll come to see all that. So just quickly, uh, make sure you bring your well, scientific calculators, if you have your if you have your uh, spreadsheet on your laptop, uh, it may not be necessary, but when you are practicing, you must need your scientific calculator because in exams, we're not going to do the exams using spreadsheets or whatever, okay? So when you're practicing, you have to use your scientific calculator because there are some, especially um, NPV analysis, we will, we will use some calculations that are scientific in nature. So you need a scientific calculator, okay? Then, of course, we're going to have some uh, practical knowledge on ICT and so on and so forth. So some of the reference materials that uh, you may want to see, ACC F2, F5, you know, and there is a book called uh, Management and Cost Accounting by Colin Drury, you know, and so on and so forth. But actually, even if you don't have this, it doesn't matter because I'm going to give you um, adequate materials you know, to, to be able to, you know, read, understand, and pass any three exams. So I will definitely do that, inshallah. Okay? So um, this is all from me for today. Uh, when we meet next week, inshallah, we're going to look at um, uh, the topics. But before we do that, I will take you through um, the Google Sheets spreadsheet how it works, because that's what we're going to use as our, you know, basis for um, solving uh, problems in MA3, okay? So I'm going to take you through the basics of uh, Google Sheet, and then we'll move on to our costing techniques, okay? 
So any, any comments or any questions uh, before we draw the curtain? I hope you are following me. Yes. Yeah, it was okay. Good. So do you have any questions uh, or do you want to make any comments before we, before we close? Yes, I just want to say that I'm very glad that we're using Google Spreadsheets and to you know to be able to solve these questions because you know now accountancy everything is computerized. We use software yes. and also Excel. So at least it gives you practical knowledge. So at least if you go to a workplace, you'll be able to familiarize yourself with all of this. Because even when I'm working, we use Excel to do bank reconciliation and stuff. But if you don't have this hands-on knowledge on how to use Google Spreadsheet, and you find it difficult. Because when we go to this institution, all we use is these Excel softwares and stuff. So it makes it easy for someone to just adapt and get into a system without finding it very difficult. I mean, I really like the fact that, you know, you're introducing us to this Google Spreadsheet. Excellent, excellent. Good, good. I'm happy you, you appreciate it. So this is the reason why, to be honest, you cannot compare our online class to, um, to, to I mean, uh, actually, this, this is like a blessing in disguise for, for us. Uh, I'm sure it's going to be difficult for some of you uh, because there is a, you know, internet problem in, in the country and so on. And uh, sometimes um, it might be difficult to get a credit or so. But I'll advise you ensure that you get your credit from, from UTG. And even if you're not able to get a credit from UTG, try to get, you know, maybe uh, go to a friend who is employed, use their Wi-Fi or go to, there are a lot of houses now, you know, in this country here that have got Wi-Fi. Make sure, please, you don't miss any class. Well, like, don't miss any class. Every class is so important. And I always want to go way out, trying to bring examples, trying to bring real life examples that will matter in your life. Okay? So don't just say that I can always watch the YouTube video. Like I said, the YouTube video, that is there. But if you attend the class, you have opportunity to contribute yourself. You have opportunity to ask questions. Okay? So please don't miss out on any class. And, uh, you know, some people were asking, you know, but this... Uh, particular uh, class was supposed to be a face-to-face. -face. Fine, if it is on the timetable like that. I didn't agree that with them in the first place. And then secondly, I know very well the only people who will say face-to-face -face maybe don't know the benefits of doing it online. Because if we do it face-to-face, -face, <laughs> where are we going to be able to do our, our, our spreadsheet? Where are we going to do our hands-on practice using ICT? We will not be able to do that. Okay, and just like Mr. Terawale rightly said, you need it very well. No employer will employ you in this day and age when you don't know how to use computers. Nobody, nobody. And the softwares that you use, you know, those that are working will testify to this. The softwares that we use at work are always very simple because they are just like filling forms. Those that, are, uh, 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 that have used, let's say, um, uh, Phoenix, PayPro, whatever you call it, they're simple, they're straightforward. It's just you go to Cashbook model, you fill a form. You go to uh, uh, Asset Register, it's like filling a form. But with Spessy, all the information that you gather, all the data you're gathering with uh, all your different uh, softwares, you analyze them using Spessy. So the real work, by accountants is done using spreadsheets. So your spreadsheet knowledge is very, very important. That's why in most institutions now, before they take any accounting staff, you must go through a spreadsheet exam. You must go through a spreadsheet test. Practical, hands-on, okay? That will be added to your interview score. So please, let's ensure that we attend class and we attend on time. And as we go along, we'll try to organize some uh, um, some makeup makeup classes, yeah, makeup classes, so we can be able to cover the syllabus. But don't even worry uh, whether we're able to cover the syllabus before the exam, before the scheduled exam time or not. No, don't worry. As far as I'm concerned, what is important is for you to have an understanding of the syllabus. Um, getting an A plus, an A minus, or A star star is not important. But what is important is your knowledge. There are people who have qualified you know, from universities, not just UTG, but even universities in the US, universities in the UK,
that have got good scores, but in real life, they cannot apply their knowledge. And because they cannot apply their knowledge, they're suffering at work. Because everybody knows that this guy, you know, I, I had to call it, is uh, not capable to handle this post, even though he has got um, uh, how many MBAs, he has got how many MSCs or whatever. Getting those qualifications are not important. But what is important is you should be able to know how to practice your profession. You cannot be called a lawyer and then you gather all the LLMs or, or LLBs or whatever you call them, and then when you go to court, you start shaking. When you go to court, you cannot quote the constitution properly. The same. You know, if you want to practice as an accountant, you must have your professional accountancy knowledge and you must be able to apply it. Peter, if you can't apply it, go and do something else. This is not history or geography whereby you do a lot of talking, 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 talking. This is practice, practice, practice. Okay? Um, so I, I think we, 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 we have to draw the quote in here. I hope you like the first class. This is, a, this is on a lighter note to, to bring you to, 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 to speed as to what is expected and stuff. I, I hope you like the class, yeah? Hello, are you getting me? Yeah, yeah. Yes, so. Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Good, good, good. So if there are if there are no other observations or comments to make, I think we we're going to stop here. We're going to stop here. Then I'll see you next week, inshallah. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay, right.